there are really different people here on the stage. And in every, you can tell that they are really great and experts in their fields, but we will find a common denominator among them, and that is future, and that is change. And uh, can I please ask you, Mr. Barker, uh, how do you stay fit in terms that you don't lose sight in the paradigm change? Because it's so hard sometimes to not be blinded yourself. You are a renowned author, everybody is listening to you, we do agree with you, but then how do you stay fit? Not to be done. Um, I think the simplest, most useful way to protect yourself from paradigm paralysis or paradigm blindness is to read broadly outside your field. Just as simple as that. Again and again, the breakthroughs start somewhere else and then work toward your industry. And so if I were to make any recommendation, I would say find yourself uh, 15 sites or 15 publications that are substantially beyond your field of expertise and visit them regularly, not necessarily every month, but regularly, and see what's going on there. That, that, that is a, a pliancy activity that will keep you open to new possibilities. Mr. Stevie, do you do that? Do you have time? We were just uh, listening about for the managers and for the leaders, and that the managers have res responsibility now and the leaders have in the future. But do you have any time to be, because you're a manager and the leader at the same time, how do you find yourself in this reality to be a leader, but being a manager as well? Well, you know, in my perspective, it's not about whether you, uh, whether you have time, but uh, it's a question of the priorities uh, for what do you take uh, your time. And I was just thinking, uh, actually listening to you about whether we do part of uh, what you're saying also, uh, out-of-box thinking and benchmarking with other industries. And actually in the uh, technical, technological field, uh, being in the automotive industry and uh, in well-being, uh, construction, uh, we are using uh, lots of ideas right now from, from the aerospace, uh, for example, and other branches which are very useful. But what is maybe very interesting also is that uh, we put a lot more effort even or as well on the business model innovation just technical technological innovation and fitting these two together in a very powerful tool and in this respect we are very much looking actually at all other industries than really ours and we are applying these models from the other industries definitely yes. Deepa is the design part of change as well if we we were seeing and we heard the quotes for steam jobs and one of the things how he changed our minds and view was also design. Do you think that's uh, one of the important part of shifts or changes? I absolutely think so because I think design actually motivates behavior change. And I think that we also need to emphasize that intellect is important, but paradigm shifting and making an impact also begins a lot with empathy and just being awake. I think microloans are probably one of the great examples where this wasn't about intellect, it was about genuine empathy. And I think we shouldn't be too satisfied with observing trends because you need to be able to go 10 levels deep and see how do I help people cope with change? You know, for example, we all know that more couples are getting divorced. There are two working people in a household. There are more dads who want to spend time with their kids. Yet it seems to take 20 years to put a diaper change facility in the men's bathroom. <laughs> when we decide to do it, it's a matter of putting four screws in a wall. But that requires not being satisfied with observing a trend, but being able to help people cope. And I think there are simple, elegant solutions to complex social changes sometimes. Luchka, but you are seeing the trends, and you can tell by the trends that the world as a whole is not going to the right direction in terms of, it's a big question mark, will we survive? And I don't want to be, you know, like, spooky in this, but. There is a question, what the quality of life will be? And the trends are not good. What to do now? How to find a quick solution? And maybe just to add on, are we already in the, in the sea level? What Mr. Barker explained, is there a big crisis so it's getting harder and harder or not yet? Yeah, well, well, all increasing trends are not always positive. I know that you are coming from the business world, but coming from the field of physics, and specializing in environment, uh, we actually have the problem you mentioned. 
uh, it's boundary. And uh, the planet Earth has boundaries, finite boundaries. So we would like to grow, business would like to grow, population actually grows, uh, but planet doesn't grow. It's the best planet around. But, so we have this problem of our game. We would like to play the game, but not within the boundaries. When I was a child, yeah, that the dreams were allowed because we, we've seen rockets. Uh, the astronauts were flying to the moon and it was just a question of time when we will inhabit Mars to have additional ground to play on. But it did not happen. So now we know that that's all we've got. And uh, actually, uh, paradigm shift is something that we need on that level as well. And uh, I was not pretty very satisfied with your answer about how to change banks uh, to behave uh, differently. They are still looking for the paradigm. So is military industry looking still for a paradigm because all they know is how to grow, make more wars. It's not very popular in globalized world, but when you do a, a big war, everybody loses in the end. So they are missing a paradigm. Uh, and actually, uh, what Violeta said about this um, paradigm, paradigm in our values, in our this shift is somehow missing from this picture. Uh, and I dare, <laughs> maybe when I have a microphone, even to criticize a little, not Steve Jobs, but uh, you know all these paradigm shifts, they were made very, very smart. So. There were times I only needed one computer. But because of the paradigm shift, I have now a computer in my office. Then I have, of course, Steve Jobs' uh, tablet. But I have, all, I have to have also my uh, another computer because I cannot plug my USB into Apple's one. So I ended up, because of paradigm shifts, with three times more computers. Same goes for the cars. Europe goes for electric cars. But we will all need the classical one because electrical one will not take me to the seashore and back. So what, where are these, some of these paradigm shifts leading the world? In the finite ground. So this game gets out of these boundaries and that's what it's been. No time that we are now. between paradigm, is that the thing why we don't have a single answer? In, in not rebuttal, but in agreement, but expansion, we are in, in many places in transition. And um, the electric car is the beginning of the transition. We can with no cars before that transition is done. But I think your, your call for a understanding of planetary boundaries, what the actual limits of the planet are, is crucial. Because some people have a pretty good sense of that. A lot of people do not. And so part of, I think, the technology will respond as we get that defined more thoughtfully. Uh, at least we've got a, uh, a, a carbon footprint measure. And at least we've got a climate change sensitivity uh, beginning to grow. We also have people who are trying to convince us that that's not true. So it's, it's, it, we are very much in transition on extremely important uh, new rules for how to deal with the world in a successful way. But we sometimes need
business often reacted to youth activists, um, dismissed youth as being really idealistic. And likewise, I think a lot of young people in, traditionally have viewed business as just seeking profits and, and viewing that as a bad thing. I think increasingly both parties are recognising uh, that there isn't that division and that often the best way to achieve a social return is to work through business. Uh, and often the best way to achieve a financial return, uh, as Deepa touched on, is to engage consumers um, who are socially aware. Uh, but also I think sustainability is often linked into reducing costs. Uh, so because we are seeing greater alignment of social and financial returns, and I think that both parties are increasingly recognising that we're not playing against each other, that we're actually on the same team. Uh, and I think if we are on the same team, it is much easier to develop those innovations to come up with those solutions. Uh, so yes, I'm optimistic. Great. So I'm behaving like a waiter who never looks at your table. Now I'm looking at you. Is there any question at this point? Yeah? Would anybody like to pose a question? Okay. I have a question for... for did we all get the microphone? Yeah. She's just coming. Okay. Could you please introduce yourself? Thank you. Yourself? I would like to ask Mr. Okay. Uh, my name is Vlad Storjanic. I'm from Slovenia. I would like to ask Mr. Baker. Uh, Barker. Barker, sorry. You should get that. Uh, uh, right? I started to do waiter and now Baker, you are a baker. Baker, <laughs> Barker, <laughs> Barker. Uh, at the end of the day, the leader is back on his own. He has to make a decision. In your presentation, you said there's an intuition in it. Because he can rely on his team, but when he's called up, for his decision, he can't say, okay, I made this made a decision based on the team. Are there any other tools than, in, than intuition when making uh, this decision for the future? When you make an, uh, an assessment, is that uh, just another idea or is, is this a new paradigm? Let me speak to that in, in, a, in a funny way, because uh, I made this point very specifically with the, the young people yesterday. Um, when you are trying to join the, the development of a new paradigm. Not, not, you're not the paradigm shifter themselves, but you're, you're coming along with it. Typically, if you come in early, there are not enough problems solved to prove that you've made a wise decision. That's the intuition, okay? So there is a risk that you take if you're going to be an early adopter to a new paradigm that the, what I call the settlers don't have to take because the settlers wait until the, the data is, is complete. The dilemma these days is it used to be you could come in with a lot of money as a settler, buy up the land and do something. That doesn't look like it's working anymore. So there is an intuitive judgment you're going to have to make that you will not ever have enough data at that, at that inflection point to say, boy, this is absolutely the right thing. Um, two dilemmas with coming in early. One, you, you pick a paradigm that, as you said, doesn't go anywhere. It solved 15 problems, you thought, what a great deal, it solved five more, and that was it. So you didn't have a whole new territory to solve, it was a truncated idea that didn't go anywhere. Um, second thing is coming in too soon. Uh, I flew with a guy out to San Diego who had gotten a call from Apple inviting him to come out and show his apps to Apple. Now, I want you to understand what that, you know, what Apple called him, he didn't call them. He was, it wasn't a, can I come make a sales call? They said, would you please come out? So I said, how long have you been working on these apps? He said, oh, I actually started with them on Palm Pilot. And nobody wanted them. So I said, how long ago was it? He said, about eight years ago. What did you do in the meantime? He said, oh, I started another business that kept me going so that when the true app business opened, I had these things ready to go. That's an example, those are the two risks. Too soon? That's an absolute risk that you have to face, and a, a paradigm that looked good that turned out not to be a dead end, basically. It turned out to, to not have problems solved. So I, I wish there was a, a very clear way to take the measure. I've not seen one yet. So it's a risk, it's a risk business. So when people are calling you, they must be aware, and they must want to step out of their comfort zone but it's really hard to step out of the comfort zone. Who does call you? Uh, are there leaders, top leaders, CEOs, president of the management board? Who usually calls you? Um, typically, middle or senior leaders. Once in a while, uh, I will get a call from a supervisory
council that has been given the power by the CEO to bring in their own speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually it's middle, upper. Okay, but the decisions ISTAC are made usually at the end of the day by the presidents of the board of CEOs. Um, <coughs> who do you call when you need this kind of changing your mindset? Well, uh, you know, first of all, I'd say that uh, uh, our attitude towards future, which is being mentioned so frequently today here, is that uh, there is no future yet uh, as of this moment. It's not something that uh, exists, that is out there for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and therefore it cannot be you know, discovered uh, in that sense, because this would be the work of a follower, I guess, and this would be the attitude and the approach. So our attitude is that uh, it's all still to be created be at least co-created. Uh, it's not somewhere in the crystal ball, it's not on the first uh, pages of the newspapers, obviously. There is something, but uh, it's all the result of our passion about controlling maybe the future, uh, as we are not even able to control our presence, obviously. Uh, so what we are trying to understand is really the factors uh, that are going to influence that future, uh, that is uh, social, Demographic, for sure, the resources, energy issues, ecological, uh, legislative, and all the others, to figure out what that future very likely will demand from us to be creating proactive, which is what we turn into technology roadmaps, as we call them in Hydria, for the next 10 15 years, which is our innovation schedule to which we dedicate the uh, human competence and resource. Cool, sorry to interrupt. Who is on the team? Who is there to? To it's the specialists in that uh, uh, level already from our uh, institutes, uh, which are developing these programs. And we are, for example, you with our new diesel port start system of the Euro 7 generation to be on the market in 2018 uh, mm -hmm. until 2025. And unless we have figured it out until now, we know that we are out of business between 2018 and 2025. But this will be cannibalized by the electrical vehicles, so at the same time, and requires long uh, depth, long, uh, let's say, breadth and very uh, deep pockets as well. We need to cope with the hybrids and electrical vehicles. So we will be present in a super premium uh, electric car with four times 100 kilowatt motor bridge wheel in 2015, which will have the range of 300 kilometers, 400. So the, the okay. technical, technological advancement in terms of everything what has been heard about the I was getting worried for a small second about the well, with no cars, but this will take a bit more. Uh, everything is going uh, forward very fast, uh, no doubt about it. So we turn this uh, into reality, uh, and we accompany this with our business model innovation development as well. This is how we do things. But again, we involve suppliers, we involve customers, we involve universities, we involve also the best specialists there exist globally in our field, but again, also the people which are completely outside the world field, to get the, the, the out of box view of that. I just want to make one observation. If you remember, he has early comment about there really isn't the future, but he's ready for 2018. I'm very impressed. <laughs> you do think about the future, and it sounds like you do a great job of it. Yeah. Ms. Agata, you want to comment? I have the same comment, but I, I also don't agree that, there, that we don't know nothing about the future. Uh, because I'm a trained meteorologist, and actually what we did for the whole period of the study, you have to predict weather next day and the day after day. So yes, we can predict a lot of things for the future. That's the problem. Because talking about environment or planet again, we have some problems that will stay there forever. So we can predict that we will not solve the chemistry of the atmosphere. We can quite well predicted that today we are 7 billions and at least 9 billions will be there in the next 20 years. And we can predict that we will need for that reason and for the changing of our lifestyle 50% more energy at least, 50% more food and we will need 30% more water. So I just think that, well, there are of course uh, different assessments, but things will not go down. We will not be less people, we will not need less food or less water. So in order to, up to some extent, we have to be ready for this future. So we, we just yeah, make a very short point, because we completely agree, but what I'm saying is that in our thinking, 
framework model approach, we are taking this as the element which are influencing in that future. But on the other hand, in that unknown element, it is what the exact answers to respond to these factors will be. Will it be an electrical car? Will it have a technical technological advancement that will allow us to have a hydrogen car on the road in the mass by 2020 if something really happens in between? If we are capable to do something, that it will happen, this is what we get so that's yes, it. Yes. I completely agree with this. Les, could you explain us what you do, how you uh, kind of want to change the world, what kind of steps you take? Sure. Um, so Joel Barker made two good points, I think. Many good points, but two I of them were... I would say more, yeah, actually. <laughs> two, two of them were the importance of paradigm shifts uh, and also the people who are best positioned uh, to come up with those paradigm shifts. Uh, and I think he was right when he mentioned about youth and university students in particular uh, coming at things with fresh ideas uh, and that there is a benefit in having less expertise uh, because you can come in and ask those questions. Uh, so one of the things that I've tried to do over the past couple of years uh, is provide an opportunity for university students to work uh, with all types of socially conscious organisations, both non-profit, social enterprises and also for-profit businesses uh, to try to identify those paradigm shifts uh, that both uh, create social impact uh, but also benefit the business as well. Uh, so I started 180 Degrees Consulting back in 2007 and I encountered a lot of the problems that Joel mentioned. Um, a lot of people told me that university students couldn't consult for businesses, we didn't have the credibility, we didn't know what we were doing, uh, it wouldn't work in Sydney and it certainly wouldn't turn into an international organisation. Um, and then over the past five years, I, I mean, I've encountered a lot of problems along the way, uh, but I think that looking back, when we look back and see that we've uh, got now 12 branches around the world, another 10 or so setting up. Uh, we've worked with over a thousand different businesses and organizations around the world. Uh, we've got really good feedback. I'm constantly getting emails from businesses uh, thanking us for having university students come in and work with them. Uh, I think businesses are increasingly recognizing that university students do have something to offer. Uh, and that something is coming in with fresh eyes uh, to look at the problems that businesses are facing to try to develop creative solutions to those challenges. Uh, and from a business perspective, often it's a case of you've got nothing to lose and potentially a lot to gain. Uh, you can have access to new ideas, uh, and I think that that's therefore the business's role uh, to select which paradigms they're going to act upon and which ones they're not. Uh, so that's one main way I've tried to be involved. Um, but I, I've also tried to do some consulting work myself. Uh, one area of uh, focus for me is an area called microinsurance. A lot of people have heard about microloans. Joel and Deepa both mentioned that. Microinsurance is a new area of microfinance, uh, which is focused on trying to develop new ways of protecting the poor uh, by developing insurance. And the traditional insurance model is you go to a consumer, often in person, uh, you offer them a price for that insurance uh, based on sort of the uh, actuarial work that's happened behind the scenes. Uh, and then you pull those funds as a way of providing insurance. Uh, one thing that I'm working on is a venture called Insurers, uh, which sort of challenges that paradigm in a few ways. Uh, firstly, it offers peer-to-peer -peer insurance, uh, kind of following the Kiva-like model. Uh, so that's the first sort of main innovation. Our second main innovation is linking it in with mobile banking. Uh, mobile banking itself is a paradigm shift, uh, particularly in East Africa, uh, but linking that in and providing consumers with the opportunity to directly purchase insurance off their phone. Uh, and the third way is actually enabling consumers to actually set a price for their insurance rather than people just approaching them and saying purchase insurance for $4.18, that's an actuarially fair rate. They have no idea how that was determined. Uh, so I think that um, having people uh, like myself who might not have as much insurance expertise uh, as some of the other people I'm working with at Oxford, uh, but who can come in with a fresh mind to offer businesses new ways of doing things that they might not have thought of. So I, I do think there's a benefit there. Deepa, when you travel around the world, you consult to different startups and multinational firms. And what Mr. Barker said, he said that in business you must listen. What do you hear when you go around the world? Do you hear the same problems or different problems? And of course, when you're consulting a startup and a multinational, what do you hear? Um, I think you know, there's a lot of lot more convergence than we believe in terms of the problems people are trying to address. I think whether people are in established markets or in emerging ones, there's a lot of the same issues, and I think that makes me quite hopeful. For example, you know, 
when you're dealing with the poor. It's not absolute income that's a difficult problem to deal with. It's the issue of income volatility. Some people can afford something one year and then if the monsoon is bad, they can't afford it the next year. But increasingly with job insecurity in the West, income volatility is a reality on a global basis. Um, you know, the same thing, everyone talks about Apple making huge breakthroughs in usability because everyone from one to eight, you know, 91 likes to use that interface. Um, but I think when you're trying to deal with poor countries, you actually have for every product, you have to be able to deal with appealing to the breadwinner of the family, their parents, their children, and maybe their grandmother. So you have to have a multi-generational interface with low training and everything else because it's a lot of a group buying decision. Uh, so the idea of usability is huge no matter whether you're a multinational, whether you're a startup, NGO, uh, whatever the issue is. People are time crunched. If you're poor, you have to work three jobs, and if you're rich and want to stay that way, you have to do the same thing. Um, so it's a lot of these same issues, and I think that you know some companies are actually starting to realize that. It used to be that people felt like they needed a completely customized approach to every single company. Now there are a decent number of projects where people are saying the global middle class has a certain aesthetic sense, they have certain habits, because there is an evolution um, and uh, you know, as income levels rise, there's a fairly predictable pattern. So I think there's a lot more convergence than people might realize. And I think everyone has the same issue of, am I staying relevant? Am I demanding too much behavior change? Because I think what all great companies do is just something very simple. They really are uh, able to drive that fine line between helping people deal with their desire to evolve, but also uh, managing force of habit. And that's where the really good innovations are. And I think we just have to keep that in mind, whoever we're dealing with. And also not only decide what we think other people's needs are, but deeply understand their aspirations. Mr. Barker mentioned that it's important that you kind of give your challenges and problems out there and you listen to others. And there are many business people here in the audience, so you have opportunity now and who will be the first one who will get this opportunity to tell your challenges and uh, questions, problems. And you have these great people up here and in the audience who can maybe find a solution. So is there anybody who would like to share the challenge that you think about? Sonia? Thank you a lot. I first would like to um, that I admire all the panelists. It's a great debate. and. Uh, you're proud, Ruchka and Istok, to have you here, that you're Slovenes presenting, presenting in this uh, panel. Joel, thank you for um, researching the future. Matt, thank you for being the future. And if I question, a question for you, and also a bit of a challenge, as uh, we were um, challenged now by, um, by Aisha. Uh, microloans was mentioned a few times. Maybe it's the word that was mentioned beside challenge and future, and uh, what's what when leaders the most uh, today. And within that that paradigm that, that happened, I see there are two things. First is that when it happened, it opened our minds or minds of a lot of uh, people and uh, businesses to the poor. The poor suddenly became, in, uh, became a group of consumers. And that changed a lot for, for a lot of uh, industries. But also, at one point that was not mentioned, but is important for the success of microloans, was that First, they, they started as an idea, but it developed when it was turned to women. It was women who made microloans successful. So, are women a paradigm shift? Which is probably a, a bit of a strange question because I know that from Adam and Eve we were supposed to be together. But, are women happening as something new to the society and also to the trends that are coming up? Thank you, Sonia. I think the women are the answer. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, it's evolving, and I think there's a lot of people who can cite on both sides. I, there's a lot of, uh, you know, studies that, that show, you know, this model it really worked because you were lending to a group. And this idea of, you know, not losing your face, being part of the community is what uh, made it work. It's hard to say. I'm not as much of an expert on microloans. Um, I would like to maybe have this um, to it. But, in many other, there are a lot of cultural shifts that are, are traced to women, but you know, it's hard to say because there's a lot of things that say once 
you reach certain income levels. There's also studies that go the other way that said behavior starts to really um, correlate more to rank in life and your position rather than your gender. So it's very difficult to make a generalization there. I might make one comment. One interesting thing about microloans and how Muhammad Yunus rolled it out is that a lot of the resistance to the adoption of that actually came from women. Um, when he was initially going around selling the loans, it was women who said, no, no, we don't touch money, that's the husband's business. And actually changing the mindset of the beneficiaries is often a challenge as well that we wouldn't often expect. You also said that you cannot say that young people will find a paradigm shift or will tell us where to go, nor all, not maybe. Yeah. No, as I said, or gender. Or gender, yes. So, a good friend of mine went to a conference in India. He was invited to, to speak on world peace, and he's got a project that's extremely interesting. Uh, but uh, he was asked a question after the, uh, his presentation. He said, there's one thing you could do that change the world dramatically for the better. What would it be? And he would say, he said, empower the other 50%. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's the answer. You know, we've got to get everybody involved. involved. Is there a problem sometimes that young people think that all or older people are the other 50%, what we heard? Is that a problem? I'm, I'm of that age, yes, I think that's true. <laughs> we, we older folk can have good ideas too. Okay. <laughs> so do we have any business challenge that you wanna? Yeah, we do. Hello, I'm Vadim Vodev. And my question to you is, I don't think it's a matter so much of finding paradigm shifts, especially with the internet today and the exposure to media. I think it's more of a matter of choosing which paradigm shifts you get involved in. And I would like Joel to, have, to hear Joel's experience on that, because the problem is, especially at a university, when things evolve so rapidly, especially how Nat was mentioning, and when you're in a consultancy, you get exposed to so many industries, so many new ideas, it's, you always have a choice. The question is, what should you go for? Should you go for your gut? Should you go for what you like? Or should you go for what you're best at? Or the one that you actually risk less? Which is your advice? Um, I'll start on that one, but I'm sure others have. Um, I, I have this little quadrant that I left out today that I, I go through this, which is um, keep your paradigm, keep your customer. Keep your paradigm, change your customer. Change your paradigm, keep your customer for, for another reason change your paradigm, change your customer. Those are increasingly more difficult. So part of, the, part of the dilemma of changing paradigms, for instance, think about changing your paradigm, changing your customer, and trying to be successful in that. So there are different ways to approach this that make it cut more risky or less risky. And the one I have seen most often is keep my paradigm, change my customer because that is the least internal change I have to do. I go out and look, look for something. And by the way, Deluxe uh, Check Company did that. They were able to say, okay, we've been making all these checks for all these corporations for all these years, and that's going away. We still want to make checks. Who can we sell to now that we never even considered before? For those people, it was a big deal to have Deluxe Check offering this, this whole new uh, service. Uh, from their point of view, it allowed them to hang on to their paradigm and practice it longer. So that would be, at least that's a start to answer your question, then maybe we have some more comments. Um, I think in terms of coping with, you know, paradigm shifts or even changes that you know need to happen, part of it is designing <laughs> systems that make that behavior change a lot easier for people. I mean, I'll give you an example from India, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, they didn't have organized dairy production, it was a huge problem, there was a huge problem of malnourishment because people used to have, to, the milk that was bought wasn't reliable, people used to go around with cows and milk cows and they would always add water, dirty water, people would get sick. And they said, we don't have the money to set up commercial dairies. And there was a simple innovation from the town um, near where I was born where this guy said, we have to stop paying milk producers based on the volume of milk let's pay them based on the fat content of their milk. There is absolutely no incentive then to contaminate the milk, to add anything, and what happened was people were actually um, started to take much better care of their animals because they knew that that would translate into more income. And 
it really became a point of pride for farmers to say, I supply to Amul Dairy, because I can tell people I'm an honest business person. There was a pride in doing that. And these cooperatives were copied across the country, and within a very short period of time, in about 20 years, it became, you know, India is actually the world's largest milk producer. Ice cream, cheese used to be considered a luxury and taxed as one. Millions of people have access to clean food because of something so simple. So the problem might be very complex, the, the stakes might be high, but I think when it comes to you know, these shifts, these changes, even we know we need to make, making that behavior change as simple as possible is something that we have to really focus on. Is that right, Just because I think we are, we are kind of creating new paradigms ourselves here uh, in a very positive way because this involvement of the law, not because of the cheap populism, but because of the I would say balance in the nature is something that we need to, to use uh, because we are, in a positive sense, different and we need differences to produce new quality. So this is, I think, one thing. The other thing which is, I guess, worth mentioning what we're discussing here is that uh, it is about time to make a shift in our heads about the uh, renewables, about the zero emission society which is coming because we are still taking it as a threat, I feel, even through this discussion, which is not the case. Because it is a huge opportunity, and each threat which you can see on time, you can still change into the opportunity. And for us, it's a huge business, even in the co-generation, tri-generation, photovoltaics, thermal solar, geothermal, which is we are putting together now to have a solar cooling systems on the market in 2030 and on. So when we think this in our heads, it will be a great step forward as well. And I think what, what I was mentioning before about the future not being there yet, I was just trying to say that when we are saying it's there, we also agree that it's going to be kind of created somehow, it's a motion by somebody else. And as long as it's, going, as it's going to be created just by somebody else, I'm really getting worried about that future mm -hmm. because today's leaders in politics and somewhere else, in terms of the credibility, it, it's, it's worrying me. But as long as it is in our hands, and I'm profoundly sure it is in our hands because the situation which we are facing now with the crisis needs to be resolved by great steps in the innovation, technical, technological, and business models. And as long as it is in our hands, I'm sure it will be a positive one. I'm, I'm confident. Awesome. Right, Okay, I can comment on the uh, involvement of women. Yeah, for sure. If I would be a business leader, I would always ask and empower women where we are talking about long-term decisions, because women are great on long-term. But on short-term, I think men are the fighters, so they go and fight. And, but on the long-term, technically, I would bet on women always. Oh, you're <laughs> risking now. You have a lot of women okay, there. Then, <laughs> you, you told us we should uh, make this uh, should. round table more women. <laughs> If you have to choose among many paradigms, or if you are in a doubt, um, researchers, university researchers, we all open are at these crosswords, uh, crossroads. And, uh, I would maybe doesn't work for everybody, but it always worked for me. Uh, it's time to listen to your intuition, or put it in the women women's way. Listen to the heart. <coughs> So do we have anybody who listens to the mind and the heart and wants to vote the question? Yeah? We have three, actually. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bojana Zupanic. I come from the company Danfoss. And first, I would like to thank organizers for inviting us to be uh, partners for this business forum. <laughs> because uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that me and all of my colleagues from, from the company uh, feel a little bit more relaxed now going out of the ordinary work and uh, coming back with fresh new ideas. And uh, to my question, um, I would like to go back a little bit to this leadership role, because after all, this is a business forum. Um, and I would like to hear your, your opinion on um, Looking, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years from now, when uh, these youth will be our leaders, um, how, how will uh, this leadership role be changed in 15, 20 years from now? How, what is going to happen with the practices like performance management or teamwork or all these kind of things that exist right now in, uh, on the workplace? I think already we're seeing 
that some of the most successful companies are the ones that are most innovative in relation to performance. I mean, even Google uh, allows their employees to spend 20% of their time working on the project of their choice that can be completely unrelated to their main job. Um, and I think that when we, I mean, that's something that's pretty hard to measure because every different project will have a different metric to go by. Uh, but in terms of leadership, I think a, a few trends are emerging. Firstly, um, related to sort of the increasing focus on creativity it is a decrease in the hierarchy in a lot of organizations. I think the top-down management structure isn't as conducive to innovation and it's not as conducive uh, to a good environment uh, for employees, which is becoming increasingly important. Uh, and so from a leadership perspective, uh, which relates to what we were talking about at the start actually, I, I think one important thing is not so much for the leaders to be the ones to come up with those paradigm shifts. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily that conflict between how you spend your time. I think it's more about leaders just being open to the possibility of completely changing the direction of the organisation or be opening to, open to suggestions that employees may have. Well, I'd like to speak to that just and offer an alternative to that because I work with 3M. Uh, they are very hierarchical. They are very creative. So it's not just a structure that is an is or an isn't. It's that attitude that you were talking about inside because they were one of the very first to free up their researchers you know, for, for one day a week to do whatever they wanted to do. Now, by the way, there was an interesting, uh, how, how can I frame this? Um, the guy who's now head of Boeing was head of 3M. Yeah, he was, he was head of uh, 3M for about uh, 14 months, I think. Anyway, when he came in, he said, uh, you know this thing about this one day a week thing, you can do whatever you want? He said, I'm gonna apply Six Sigma to that, and so what you're gonna to have to do, if you wanna do that, you're gonna to have to tell me what it is that you're gonna come up with and, what, and put this set of criteria on that meant you had to tell him in advance of what you were gonna discover. <laughs> Literally, innovation in those 14 months dried up in 3M because of this leader putting in these kinds of requirements that closed down the process. When he left, the new CEO, who is a great guy, came in and in his first uh, speech to the, the people who had this free time, he said, by the way, you know those criteria, just throw them out. <laughs> you know, let's that, get back to business. Is that, uh, do you do something you like know, that? In my view, of course, uh, leadership uh, somehow is always context dependent. But I guess long term, looking our context is still uh, looking for growth, looking for uh, something better, looking in a very positive sense for, for, for contributing to a better world. And if this is the case, uh, leadership, I think, still will be a lot about uh, charisma. It will be about uh, uh, drawing this picture of the better world, a realistic one, and attracting everybody who is with us to understand that, to take it as their own, and uh, bring in the competence, of course, uh, and capabilities to, 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 to make it true. And in that sense, I think we are out of the you know, hierarchical relationships going to the project management. We are into the task forces, we are into the leading leaders, which is what I have around. And I'm just first among the equal, and uh, I think this is positive as well. And I think this is uh, also the crowd which is going to be a part of these leaders. And this is the future that we are facing here today. And at this point, I would also say that it's, uh, of course, also time to take the to take the space, to take the spot, you know, to, to raise the voice, because the future that we are discussing here about is actually it is your future. So. You also need to decide about it. You need to say, what do you think this future should be like? Uh, raise the voice, and we are here to hear you and to include you as much as possible, as, and as soon as possible. Do you think they are, the people, the business people are listening to you? I want to hear the news now. Do they? I, I don't mean particular, just panelists, but do they listen to you? Or do you not speak? I hope they did listen and they do speak. So we have two more questions, I think. Yes, please. My name is Amanda Dubovishik. I'm coming from Slovenia. I would just like to add something about whether is it possible to change or um, to choose in which paradigm shift we are going to take part in. Uh, let us remember uh, into the marketing field, and we know that basically companies exist because they want to market, because they want to sell. And a big paradigm shift has been from transactional 
marketing to relationship marketing. And what we are facing today is that companies actually um, know that they have customers who would basically uh, prefer to work with companies on the basis of the relationship. But the leaders, leaders manage and lead their workers, their employees, actually in accordance with the old paradigm shift. Do you know what I, we understand what I mean? We actually, as a company, as a leader, we accept new paradigm, but we lead and manage people in accordance with the old paradigm. And in the, in the marketing field, here it has been noticed a big problem, I mean, uh, when we talk about the success of the companies. Thank you. I'm not sure I completely understood the question. I think it was that, that at one level they're practicing the transactional relationship, at another level they're not. And what, what does that do to the organization? Was that, was that the essence of the question? The problem was, uh, the, the question was, whether do you see there is a problem when a company accept one paradigm but manage and lead people with another, people with another paradigm? I think you're partly touching on the issue of organizational culture. Uh, and, I, and I think that's something that's incredibly difficult to change. I mean, at a business school, you have, hear the word culture thrown around all the time. Uh, but I think a few people recognize just how important it is. And I think if, if you look at the most successful companies, they're often the ones that have been started with a set culture where everyone who comes into the firm buys into that culture and almost self-selects into that environment. So I think the paradigms which challenge the culture of a firm uh, are going to be very difficult to get buying across the board and to change it in the way that you seek. Let me give an illustration of that. Um, I was working with a food company in Minneapolis, and we were doing, basically we were having them write the rules of their paradigm, it was the R&D department. And um, you, you always get about the first 30 rules are out of the book. And then somebody tosses out a rule that's not written down, and everybody goes, oh yeah, that's right. And then all of a sudden, it just explodes with all these unwritten rules. So I was working through this, and uh, it was the room was set up in an interesting way. We had the technicians over here, and all the PhDs were over here, right? And one of the technicians raised his hand, and he said, okay, here's a rule. Only PhDs can have no ideas. <laughs> so I looked over at the, uh, at the PhDs, and they had this kind of smug look on their face. Like, that's right, that's the way it is. <laughs> So I turned back to this guy and I said, well, what happens if you have a new idea? He said, oh, you, you wouldn't believe He said, we've got to feed those PhDs one little piece at a time until they finally figure it out themselves. <laughs> and I looked over at the PhDs and you cannot believe the expression on their faces. Like, oh my God, that they did that to me, didn't they? That's a culture thing. Inside the R&D, the, the culture was, if you're a PhD, you can have an idea. So by the way, we changed the rule. We said everybody has a right to have an idea about anything they want to. And uh, we were able to, to drive that into the structure, and it absolutely made a difference in the rate of innovation and the ideas that came out. But initially, that's, there's your barrier. There's your conflict between something that should have been easy to do and the culture rules that said, uh-uh, you've got to have a PhD. Lucha, sometimes when you go around and you tell us what do you see, not as a, uh, somebody with a magic ball, but with somebody who can see in terms of even the uh, really trends, we kind of feel, oh my gosh, she's telling us this, we don't want to step out of our comfort zone, we want to live in this, and I guess it's happening in the businesses as well. But what do you think is the solution? Do you have any idea how to change everything? Well, I'm looking at the solution, actually. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of uh, paradigms, now I will use that word as well, I don't really know all the meanings of that. It's a very magic word. Uh, we'll change uh, with the young generation because uh, they are aware of the problems, but they, they may not be aware about the solution. But they, they have this feeling that we cannot go on like this. We didn't figure out that question for 20 or 40 years, but you, you, you know that. You know the problem and you, the only... Then, when you know it, you're halfway to solve it. Uh, so, I, in a way, I am optimistic. And we were talking about Facebook, about all these uh, connections, uh, especially 
is being made by young generation. I don't know a lot of 60 years old that would do Facebook. So actually you can uh, uh, do this shift. Uh, if you have a good idea, if you have a good thought, uh, like you do in this competition, I think this can be done very quickly. And great ideas are cheap. Actually, are in my view, it's just uh, the way how, how we put our priorities. Because we were learned, we were taught wrong what our priorities are. And uh, actually, later when it was, it was too late, but it's very hard then to change the habits. I'm not so optimistic like you are, that it's easy to change the habits of people. It's not so easy. It's actually very hard. But when you start young, when you start exchange, when you have this feeling that actually, um, you know, we are, now I'm getting a bit philosophical, but we were I generation, what matters for me. But you should be, you should be we generation. You should define what we is, because we could not do it in time. So we will leave you a lot of problems behind. But if you define new we, that you're winners. Did you have a great legacy of your father, and you also have two cultures of a legacy. I guess you have a broader view on this, and uh, how do you see it? How do you live in one world and another world, and both is home? And do you think that this interdependence that uh, Mrs. Bogatai mentioned is the one that is leading toward the uh, solutions? luxury I've had is I guess we be and having an immigrant experience going back and forth having to travel it does give you I think a lack of presumption about where change can come from and I mean I'll also make another contrarian point about innovation is that I, I will never argue against youth and passion and energy but I think diversity means also just accepting the people who may seem a bit cranky and impatient because if everyone was passionate about washing dishes we wouldn't have dishwashers so you know you have to really kind of look out and say, why is somebody not interested in this idea? Why are they completely unmoved by it? And that's the only way you can broaden the impact of what you have. Otherwise, you're preaching to the choir um, all the time. And that is not really how you can create impact. So you have to be a little bit flexible about the means and probably be much more rigid about your values and a little bit more flexible about your means. Thank you. So to them, the last question. Oh, now we all have questions. No more questions? Okay, but I, I said the last one. No? Okay, you see, I have the power of no more questions down there. But I must tell you that I'm really, truly proud today that I'm Slovene because Andrea is Slovene and she's the founder and the president of Challenge Future. And please give a big applause to Andrea. on the stage to tell us a lot. So thank you very much to all of you. And uh, the future is there. We can kind of sense it, uh, although it's in our hands, hands and in hands of everybody to do it the right way. Thank you very much.